Uh, my name's Jackie Jacob, and I am uh, the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice here on uh, eExtension. And as such, it is my job to uh, organize these monthly webinars. Um, this month's webinar is me presenting. Uh, I am a poultry specialist at the University of Kentucky. Uh, with 30 years experience in poultry extension and uh, I've worked in uh, Minnesota, Florida and Africa. So I have a variety of different uh, experiences in poultry production. Uh, one of the things that um, is helpful for people to know is chicken anatomy, uh, internal anatomy in particular, which is what we're going to review today. Um, it's important in that if you have a bird die, if you don't wanna pay the 50 or 100 bucks to send it to the diagnostic lab, you should at least open it up inside and see what's wrong. And then if you call somebody like an extension agent or a poultry specialist for help, then you have something to tell them uh, about what's wrong internally because sometimes the external um, symptoms are not conclusive. Uh, even with that, you might need a diagnostic lab, but it at least give you a starting point. So, in order to do that, you need to know what is normal so that you know what's not normal. Uh, the an understanding of chicken anatomy also helps to understand some of the nutritional or respiratory problems that could happen. Um, get a basic understanding of how the system works. So the biggest cost in poultry production is feed. 70% of our cost is feed. So uh, the first system that I want to uh, discuss is the digestive system. This is the digestive system of the chicken opened up and we'll go through it uh, piece by piece. So the first part is, whoops, the mouth, the beak and mouth. And as you know, the um, chickens do not have teeth, despite what some cartoons show, chickens do not have teeth. Uh, they use their beak to grab fo food they, and uh, swallow it. Well, they can't even really swallow. They use their tongue to push the food to the back of the mouth. The mouth contains some salivary glands and the saliva contains amylase and amylase breaks down starch. But for chickens and turkeys, they do not have amylase. So while we do, sparrows do, uh, chickens and turkeys do not have amylase. Uh, so there is not a lot of digestion going on in the mouth for the short period of time that it stays there. Okay, when I said that chickens don't swallow their food, this is because chickens have a cleft palate. Um, you can see the cleft palate here. I don't know if my um, arrow shows there, but this is the cleft palate. Um, because of the cleft palate, they cannot get, um, a vacuum in their mouth so that they cannot, oh, God's changing on its own. Where are we? Okay. So that it can't swallow because it can't get that um, vacuum. So if you watch a chicken drink, you'll see they dip their beak in the water and then lift their head in order to let the water flow down because they're not able to swallow. So that tongue is important for pushing the food to the back of the um, digest the mouth and there from there it gets into the esophagus and it travels down to the crop the esophagus as i said is the tube that connects the mouth to the rest of the digestive tract it does secrete a mucus to help lubricate and and assist with the flow 
of the um, the food down the digestive tract. It then stops at the crop, which is an outbreak outcropping from the esophagus, and it's here that the feed gets stored. It too secretes mucus and to try and keep that feed moist so it doesn't uh, compact in the crop. The crop is located uh, at the base of the neck on the outside of the body cavity. So you can see the crop uh, labeled there. This one is a very small one. It hasn't been eating a lot. Um, the use of a crop is important for um, prey types animals such as birds. So, God, this thing moves by itself. It allows them to uh, consume food and then hide and digest it. So the crop plays an important role for, um, for birds. Uh, it's here that the feed gets mixed with water that the birds drink, again, to allow that flow of consumed food through to the rest of the digestive tract. Uh, from there, uh, oh, I should say, if you can see a little bit above the, where that circle is, is where the crop can, jeez, oh, why do you do this to me? Uh, come on, go back. Um, where the crop continues into the proventriculus labeled there, sometimes the crop will get blocked. And so you get a compaction of the food and the bird can eat and eat and eat, but it doesn't continue down the rest of the esophagus. So uh, when you look at the chicken, they have this big crop hanging down from their neck. Um, the bird basically starves to death because none of the food is passing past the crop. Uh, if it's a pet chicken, some people will you know, turn the chicken upside down, massage the feed out, uh, and try and uh, use some vegetable oil to remove the blockage so that food can continue. But uh, if it's happened once, chances are it'll happen again. So. Uh, it's not always, um, you know, good prognosis for uh, birds that have had an impacted crop. So the next part is the proventriculus, which is this true stomach of the chicken. It's like our stomach. And it's here that the, the, um, the lining of the proventriculus secretes hydrochloric acid. To, pre to reduce the pH, it secretes pepsin, which is an enzyme important in protein digestion. So it's here that the digestive process actually begins. And it's funny that it's before it gets into the gizzard, which uh, are smooth muscles, which are used to grind up the feed. The muscles work in opposition, the two pairs of muscles work in opposition. If the chicken is eating a lot of pasture or whole grains, it's important that they get grit or stones or pebbles. They will stay in the gizzard and help with the grinding of the feed. Um, they'll eventually wear down and pass through. So they need a continuous supply of uh, grit. So um, if you have your birds on pasture, it's important to have um, grit. And grit can be anything, can be, uh, it's basically ground up granite if you buy it, but it could be, you know, pebbles from the, um, the ground or whatever. Um, then it goes on to, God, it changes by itself. Okay, then it goes on to the duodenum, duodenal, you can call it, you know, potato, potato. Uh, and this is where most of the digestion takes place. It receives uh, bile from liver, which changes the pH. It receives uh, pancreatic enzymes, which are important in digestion. Um, and it receives enzymes from the lining of the, the uh, wall of the intestine. 
And so this is where the chemical breakdown of the, um, the food happens. So we got the pancreas, which I said does the pancreatic juices with the digestive enzymes, the bile. Uh, chickens have a gallbladder. Not all birds have a gallbladder. It's very important in fat digestion. So if um, that's important. You can see the little green spot on uh, the liver here. Um, there's the liver. See, look, it's moving all by itself. Uh, there's the gallbladder. Um, this chicken has obviously not been eating. I mean, obviously has been eating because the gallbladder is very small. It's been emptying into the digestive tract. If it's very large, then um, it's not, the chicken has not been eating. When you process chickens for meat, you take them off feed for uh, you know, seven to eight hours beforehand. So the gallbladder is usually pretty big when you process chickens. And so if you're keeping the liver, uh, you have to be very careful not to break the gallbladder or you get green everywhere. It makes a mess, a terrible mess. Okay, so the pancreas, as I said, produces the proteolytic enzymes involved in protein digestion, the amylase for starch digestion, the lipase for fat digestion. Uh, pancreas, of course, everybody knows is involved in insulin production for the regulation of um, blood sugar levels. But in the digestive system, it's for the uh, pancreatic juices that are released into the duodenum. Uh, bile acts as a detergent, so it emulsifies the fat, it neutralizes the pH, because the digestive from the proventriculus has a low pH because of the hydrochloric acid. And most of the enzymes that the pancreas secretes into the small intestine need to have a neutral pH. So um, that's the, the important role of bile. From there, it goes on to the rest of the small intestine, uh, referred to as the lower uh, small intestine, because the duodenum is technically part of the uh, small intestine. And it's here that the nutrients that have been chemically released in the, um, good Lord, uh, the, the, um, the particles, the, the chemical uh, parts of the food that have been released into the um, digestive tract are absorbed through the lining of the intestine into the bloodstream and uh, made available to the animal. So um, again, the, there is some enzymes with some digestion going on. It is interesting that chickens do not produce lactase, which is needed to digest lactose, a sugar in milk. Uh, so you should not feed milk products with a lot of lactose to birds because it can cause diarrhea. Uh, interestingly, some people like to finish their chickens on milk. Um, I wouldn't do it the whole time. Uh, I'm not sure what the plan is for doing the milk, but um, there is a specialty chicken made in France that they finish on milk. If you're feeding yogurt as a probiotic for a health measure, um, the yogurt does not contain the lactase, lactose, so because of the lactobacillus bacteria breaking it down. So um, yogurt is safe to do if you want to use it as a uh, probiotic. From there, we get to the junction of the large and small intestine where there are two blind end pouches called cecum or cica for plural form. And the cica contain microflora, that is, they contain bacteria, they contain yeast, they contain fungi, um, and they can ferment any of the undigested material that reaches them. So um, 
it's a, all of these microflora uh, are working in the small intestine, in the cecum, and they can produce vitamins. Um, there is some backflow of the vitamins back into the small intestine, but because it is in the lower end of the digestive tract, you don't get a lot of vitamins from it. Um, the, uh, God, this thing going back and forth has got me distracted. Um, rabbits have a similar thing, but they eat their cecal droppings so that they can get those vitamins. Um, chickens do not tend to do that, so they don't get a lot out of it. There's a very short colon, um, so there's uh, very little absorption that goes on in there in terms of the vitamins, but it is where most of the water is absorbed. Um, most birds cannot handle high levels of dietary fiber, which is primarily digested in the cecum, which is why chickens um, don't eat a lot of pasture. It's estimated that they can get uh, 5 to 15% of their dietary needs from pasture, depending on the bird, depending on the pasture management, depending on the crops, the maturity, uh, a whole number of things. Um, chickens on pasture still need uh, a complete feed in order to get uh, the nutrient um, nutrients that they need. Uh, the large intestine is also called the rectum. And um, here, as I said, the absorption of water takes place. Chickens don't want to lose their water, so they, you know, recycle it through the system. And then the cloaca is the uh, end of the digestive tract. And the cloaca is the common exit point for the digestive, reproductive, and urinary tracts. And again, is important for absorbing any remaining moisture that comes along. Uh, trying to maintain that so the birds don't get dehydrated. Uh, there are two types of fecal droppings, the regular and the cecal droppings. The, um, the white material on the regular fecal droppings um, is the uric acid, which is the uh, chicken form of pee. They don't pee to lo and lose that water. They uh, convert their urea to uric acid as the waste product. And uric acid is not soluble in water. So uh, it's deposited on the uh, fecal material that is excreted. Before we go on to the reproductive system, are there any questions on the digestive system? I went through it kind of quickly. Uh, I just wanted to give you an overview of the digestive system and where some problems can occur and why chickens are not cows. Cows have ruminant, rumens, which uh, are like a cica, but very large. And at the beginning of the digestive tract, and the microflora in the rumen are what break down the pasture so that the cows or other ruminants are able to get nutrients from them. Chickens do not have that. Um, poultry do not have that. Monogastrix, pigs, all of that do not have a rumen. So they cannot live on pastures alone. So I get that question a lot. Um, and I get a lot of uh, malnutrition happening on uh, chickens kept on pasture. Not seeing any questions, we will go on to the reproductive system, which is uh, the second, uh, well, main source of income. Is Jackie. that a question? Yeah. Yeah, Andres, uh, or Andres says, a uh, difference between sequel poop and regular? Yeah, that was the... Um, the pictures, this is the cecal at the bottom and the fecal material at the top. This, the cecal is only usually uh, excreted about um, once a day. The regular poop, I mean, chickens poop all the time. 
Um, it is important to look at the droppings to be alert for trouble signs. You know, you look, look for tinges of blood, look for odors, look for exceedingly runny droppings. Runny droppings could occur when chicken, chickens drink too much water in hot weather, or they could have eaten juicy treats like a watermelon. Um, color changes too might not be an area of concern, depending on what they've eaten. Uh, if they have reddish poop, for example, they could have eaten beets. Um, if the chip chickens are eating a lot of greens and water, some of the droppings might be loose. Um, the first droppings of the day can, can be quite large. Um, a broody hen seldom leaves the nest. Um, will also have extremely large droppings when she does. Um, from time to time, you might find reddish strings in the droppings. If it's not moving, it's you know probably just old intestinal lining that's being shedded. Uh, if it's moving, you might have um, worms. Uh, if there is coffee grinds in them, you might have internal bleeding. So uh, looking at the droppings can tell you a lot of things. Um, can you explain can, if it's yeah, too large? how we can, oh, chick crop is too large. Okay, um, that is happening when um, the crop has become blocked and the, the material is compacted in the crop. Um, they keep eating because they're hungry, their body's telling them they need to eat and they're not getting it. So um, the only way you can help that is to, get everything out of there. So you sort of massage the crop, you know, have the chicken upside down so that you can get that food out without going back into the lungs. Um, the, uh, it may be hard to get rid of that blockage, but it, you know, the crop is on the outside of the body cavity. So massaging it may be able to, um, have um, you know some effect in getting that blockage out adding uh, vegetable oil can help with that uh, massaging um, I hope that answers your question oh and a chick um, depends on why what you mean by too large uh, chicks when you first get them if you, they should drink first um, if they eat first, then it might get compacted. So if you get birds, especially day-old birds through the mail, the first thing you have to give them is water, and then you can give them the feed. But make sure they get the water first. Uh, if it gets blocked up, you do the sort of the same thing, but you'll probably lose a chick if, if that happens. Uh, if you have undigested bits of grain in the fecal material, especially if you're feeding a whole grain feed, you probably are not providing enough grit. Uh, they're not digesting it, or it depends on what grain it is. Some grains are harder to, um, to grind up in the, the, um, the gizzard than other grains. Um, Corn, for example, is usually fed as crack corn, um, not usually whole corn. It might, you might see more corn grains in uh, fecal material. Um, but if you're getting undigested bits of grain in the fecal material, then uh, it's not being ground up enough in the gizzard to allow for digestion. I hope that answers your questions. I'm not seeing any, oh, I got another one here. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm glad it helped you, Ken. Um, okay, we'll go on to the reproductive system. Um, for those that have uh, laying hens or breeders, one of your main sources of income involves egg production. And to understand the uh, 
functioning of the reproductive system, it's important to know the parts of an egg. Everybody's familiar with, of course, the shell, which has been, you know, taken off in this case here. The big yellow thing in the middle is the uh, yolk, and then there's the thick albumin and the thin albumin, and then the chalaza are, uh, there's two of them, and it's basically albumin wound very tightly, and it holds the yolk in the middle of the albumin. This is important to the chicken for embryo development because you don't want the embryo touching the, the inside of the shell getting stuck. You'll get um, abnormal chick development or death. So um, again, you know, eggs, while we like to eat them, are part of a reproductive system. And so you need to consider it that way. So the, the, um, the female reproductive system is made up of two main parts the ovary and the oviduct and this thing is just like moving on by itself the um unlike chickens who have two ovaries i mean unlike mammals that have two ovaries poultry have only one ovary the left one the right one trip typically atrophies after hatch although it is rare you can find a chicken with two but as i said it's very rare uh, the condition here, uh, persistent cystic right oviduct, um, is fluid accumulation in the vestigial right oviduct, so it didn't completely atrophy. Um, the abdominal cyst is uh, filled with clear fluid. It is attached to the right side of the uh, cloacal wall, you know, the, the, um, the cloaca at the end. The cysts can vary anywhere from, you know, barely perceptible to 15 to 20 centimeters in diameter. Uh, an increased incident has been seen in flocks after an infectious bronchitis outbreak. Um, oviductal cysts are necropsy findings that rarely, if ever, uh, affect the flock performance, but you may see that if you open up your chicken to see what's going on after it died. Okay, the ovary, uh, the chicken is hatched with all of the ova, the genetic material that they will ever have uh, in their lifetime. So uh, it's not like sperm that are produced on a regular basis. The chick hatches with about 3,000 microscopic yolk follicles and the yolks begin to develop after photostimulation. And chickens are sensitive to the number of hours of light in the day. They come into production with increasing day length and go out of production with decreasing uh, day length. So photostimulation refers to increasing the number of hours of light per day to stimulate the pullets to come in produ into production. God, these things drive me nuts. The yolk is produced in the liver and transported to the ovary where it is deposited in the developing follicles and the largest follicle is ovulated first. Uh, so the vitellin membrane is the, um, the membrane that surrounds the yolk or ova. And ovulation is the technical term for the release of the mature yolk from the ovary into the oviduct. And the yolk are enclosed in a sac which ruptures along the stigma, also known as the suture line in ovulation. And to try and get an idea, I hope this will work. There we go. This is a live chicken showing the ovulation uh, of an a uh, yolk from the uh, follicle in the ovary of a laying hen. Uh, this was produced by Kansas Agriculture College, which is now Kansas State University. And as you can see from the quality of the video, it is very old. Um, I'm not sure that animal welfare people would let us do that um, these days. 
So the oviduct is 25 to 27 inches long, uh, made up of five parts, the infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the shell gland, uh, also called the uterus, and the vagina. So in the infundibulum, uh, it's also referred to as the funnel, and it's actually a muscle which moves over the released gulf, the released yolk to engulf it and bring it down to the rest of the digestive tract. It's not possible to film this in a live chicken, so they did a dramatization of it so you can see that it goes over and engulfs it as a, um, its own muscles. If the muscle misses the yolk, the yolk can be deposited into the body cavity of the, the chicken. If it just happens once, um, then the uh, yolk gets reabsorbed and, you know, no problem. But if it happens on a routine basis, they're called an internal layer, and the um, yolk uh, begins to get infected and starts to um, become, uh, I don't know what you call it, rotten, basically. Uh, so, Ken, you said sometimes you've dissected and found the problem with the yolk. Some were in yellow color, but some were black. Do you mean in the ovary or in the abdominal uh, cavity? Because um, if they're black, then something is attacking the, the yolk, some sort of bacteria uh, causing a problem in the ovary, in the follicle. Um, if it's black inside the follicle, it could be a dietary thing. Um, you may be feeding cottonseed. Um, cottonseed will cause yolk to go black. Um, so I'm not sure about some wild species. Uh, they may have issues that uh, will cause the, um, the yolk to change color. Um, so I would look at, at what you're feeding if you're getting a lot of um, black yolks. But if you're getting an internal layer and you're getting rotten um, yolks in the body cavity, uh, sorry, there's nothing you can do about it and chances are the bird's going to die. Um, it's not a nice way to go. So, you know, um, do the chicken a favor and put it out of its misery. Um, I know it's hard if it's a pet chicken, but, um, you know, quality of life. Okay, so if fertilization is going to happen, and it only happens, of course, if it's been with a male, and all laying hens in uh, commercial operations are without roosters, so all the commercial uh, table eggs you buy in the store are infertile. Um, if fertilization is going to happen, it happens in the infundibulum before the rest of the material is added to the egg. It only stays here for 15 to 18 minutes. So, you know, it has a short window in which to uh, get fertilized. Uh, it then goes on to the magnum where the albumin or egg white is added. It's the longest part of the... Um, the reproductive tract, it stays here for about um, three hours. Uh, then on to the isthmus where the shell membranes are added. Uh, the isthmus is slightly contract, uh, constricted, that's where it gets its name. Stays here for about 75 minutes. And then it's on to the shell gland um, or the uterus as it's called. Um, the shell is added here. It's uh, sometimes referred to, uh, it's basically made up of calcium carbonate, but there's some magnesium and phosphorus and other things in there. But, you know, the majority of it is calcium carbonate. If the shell is to be pigmented, the pigment is added here. So um, I've had people say that white eggs uh, brown eggs are better than white eggs because white eggs have been bleached. Um, white eggs are not bleached. They came out that way. Uh, brown eggs just have the genetics to put a pigment 
on the eggs. You can get some that put green pigment um, from the Americanas. Our Americanas might have a, a light blue. Uh, so any pigment that's going to be added is added here. And it stays for about 20 hours. The vagina is not really involved in egg formation. It's made of muscle and it helps to push the egg out of the hen's body. In a, it's called ova position to, um, to lay an egg. That's the technical term for laying an egg. Um, oops. Something that is important to uh, understand is that um, when the muscle is pushing the egg out, the ovary uh, everts and comes outside the body cavity so that the uh, egg itself never comes into contact with the fecal material in the cloaca. So although the, you know, the egg and the fecal material come from the same opening, the, um, the egg does not come into contact with the fecal material uh, when it's being laid. So that, that is an important thing. And as a uh, little tidbit, egg comes down uh, small end first and is laid large end first. Just a tidbit of information. Uh, the hen has sperm storage sites. Uh, after each mating, the sperm is stored for, uh, and it can survive for weeks, although uh, typically they're most viable in the first two to three weeks. After that, it starts to go down and your chances of a fertile egg decrease. Uh, there are sperm storage sites in the vagina and in the infundibulum. So you can see that, you know, infundibulum is where the fertilization takes place. And you can see that the sperm have to make it all the way up through that uh, ovary to get up to the infundibulum in order for um, fertilization to take place. Eggs, chickens lay eggs whether or not there's a male there, whether or not there's any sperm. So, you know, some eggs are fertile, some are infertile. Um, typically, you only need a chicken to mate once a week to have good fertility. Uh, if you are trying to breed chickens and you've put them into the wrong rooster, you may have to wait a month in order to get a good guarantee that the offspring are from your chosen rooster and not the one that you accidentally put them in with. So um, that needs to be taken into consideration. This is the uh, reproductive system of the male. It's very difficult to castrate a male chicken. Surgery is necessary. Uh, the result is the production called of a capon, which is a castrated male chicken. Uh, if you're raising capons, um, which I don't suggest from an animal welfare point of view, uh, it, the surgery is done when the chickens are very young. The surgery involves coming in from each side of the, um, the back to remove the testes. It has to be done when the testes are small so that the kidneys are not damaged. The gonads uh, or the testes are the sex organs. Um, in most mammals, including humans, the testes are located in the scrotum, which is on the outside of the body cavity. In birds, the testes are found inside the body cavity uh, on either side of the backbone, um, basically with the, you know, near the kidneys. Um, the accessory organs uh, are the prostate, the seminal, seminal vesicles, the bulbary glands are common in mammals but are not present in birds. So, uh, the sperm is produced in the seminiferous tubules of the testes and then transported uh, in the ductus deferens to the outside of the rooster. Microscopically, the testes 
consist almost entirely of tubular structures known as seminiferous tubules. The sperm are produced here. The testes also produce testosterone, which is responsible for the secondary male characteristics and the different plumage patterns that they get. It's also important in the production of sperm. <coughs> Excuse me. In mammals, increasing the temperature of the testes can stop sperm production. Obviously, that is not the case uh, with chickens, which even have a higher body temperature than mammals. Whoops. <coughs> so all of the um, reproductive system for the males comes out of the same uh, vent area as the eggs. Um, so that the, the basically the cloaca is divided into three systems, which, you know, get the digestive, the um, reproductive and the excretory uh, systems. And uh, as you'll notice that uh, chickens do not have a penis. The only birds that I know of that have a penis are ducks because they mate in the water and it's important that they get penetration and ostriches. I don't know why ostriches, but you know, they have it. Um, oh, I didn't have a picture. Uh, chickens, when they mate, um, there is no penetration. It's called a cloacal kiss. and Basically, the um, chicken everts the oviduct, and the male releases the sperm, and the two touch. And when the oviduct is taken back in again, uh, it takes the sperm back in with it. Um, the laying of an egg and the mating, as I said, the oviduct comes out. And so if for some reason that gets damaged because of pecking from um, all the other uh, birds that, that may be in there, it may become inflamed and not actually go back. You get a prolapse, which uh, can cause problems. Uh, okay, I do AI for the chicken. I was wondering, they don't lay eggs every day. Some hens have laid at the interval of four, five, six days and also change the interval all the time. Um, it takes... 24 to 26 hours to produce an egg and chickens typically ovulate 30 minutes after the um, the egg is laid so that adds up uh, to more than 24 hours so um, you're gonna get uh, it's very rare for a chicken to lay every single day um, I think you're doing pretty good if you're having intervals of four, five, six days, depending on what kind of chickens you have. If you're doing AI, I assume that means they're breeders. Um, Leghorns are one of the few breeds that can lay every day. Most breeds don't. Um, they're not as heavily selected for egg production as um, leghorns, but even with leghorns, they will skip a day um, because they the they laid a la laid an egg too late in the day to be stimulated by light to ovulate again so um you can't really change the the time limit other than uh selecting for the hands that have the longer um interval between a day off that's the only way you can do that is through genetic selection which is what they've done for Leghorns. Uh, okay, we're getting close to the end of the time. I will speed up a little bit. Uh, if there's any questions about the reproductive tract, put them in the Q&A. I can see those and um, I will answer those uh, if I see them. But I wanted to continue with the reproductive system, so, I mean the respiratory system, so that we can get uh, through in time. Um, the nostrils of the chicken, of course, lead into the nasal cavity. Um, the oral cavity and the nasal cavity are interconnecting via the slit in the hard palate. That's that um, 
Birds lack a soft palate. Uh, the larynx is on the floor of the pharynx, which is basically in the mouth. Chickens do not have an epiglottis, which we have, and they have no vocal cords. The function of the larynx is solely to make sure food does not get sent down the windpipe um, when the chick swallows. Uh, the trachea is composed of tightly stacked cartilage rings. And then at the end of the trachea, uh, you can see it uh, splits into two bronchi. Uh, if a respiratory infection occurs, you will sometimes get a block at that junction because the, um, the diameter of the, the respiratory tract gets smaller. Uh, this can happen in uh, wet forms of fowl pox, for example, and so the birds die um, of respiratory failure. So if you are uh, doing a necropsy, uh, make sure that you check that area there uh, where the syrinx is to see if um, there's a blockage. The syrinx is also what we would consider the the voice box, it's uh, how they vocalize. Uh, they don't have a voice box like we do. Um, all the sounds a chicken makes, including the cock's crow, require a cooperative effort among the tracheal muscles, the air sacs, the syrinx, and the respiratory muscles. Um, and so you cannot decrow uh, a rooster because you're basically taking out an important junction in the uh, respiratory system of the uh, chicken. Um, chickens have lungs, but their lungs are different, which I'll get into. And chickens also have air sacs, which are very unique. Uh, it's very hard to show air sacs uh, in a necropsy because uh, when you open it up, you basically break the, the air sacs. Chickens have nine of them, and they're important. They don't have, uh, they're not involved in air exchange, but they act as bellows, pushing air through the lungs. Um, and the air sacs, as I said, are within the body cavities, although some of them in, extend into some bones known as pneumatic bones. Uh, where they replace the bone marrow. So uh, this also provides reduced uh, weight of the bones uh, because it has air in it. Uh, as I said, the lungs of the, the, chick, the birds are very different. They don't expand and contract like ours do. Uh, air only flows one way through the respiratory system. So you can see here, the blue is air coming in. So in the first inspiration, the air goes into the posterior uh, air sacs. And then when they expire out, it, the, that air sac pushes the air through the lungs into, uh, and then on the next inspiration, it goes into the uh, anterior air sacs. And then it, the expiration, it's pushed out uh, of the bird. So um, they don't expand and contract like we do. They also don't have a diaphragm. So uh, the way that they breathe is with the movement of the, of the ribs. So if you hold a chicken too tight, you may um, asphyxiate it because it cannot breathe. You'll see this sometimes with baby chicks that kids hold they you know they want to cuddle with the chick and they hold it too tight and the chicken is not able to breathe and while they believe that the chicken is sleeping it not i mean they basically suffocated the chicken to death because it couldn't breathe uh, because some of the air sacs which are important in respiration go into the bones some bone fractures will have an adverse effect on respiration as well. So there's the lungs. They're basically uh, tightly fitted against the ribs. And it's, you know, um, they, as I said, they don't have a diaphragm. 
It's the expansion and contraction of the sternal ribs, which are those ribs attached to the sternum or the keel bone of the chicken. Uh, air is brought in when the chest muscles draw the ribs forward and, and then lower the sternum and the raising of the sternum pushes the air out. So holding a chick too tight, as I said, can cause uh, stu uh, suffocation. Okay, um, I went over the respiratory system quickly. Um, although it is the number one um, disease, our respiratory diseases that cause problems, uh, look for abnormalities in the lungs and the air sacs. You should be able to read a newspaper through um, an air sac. If you can't, if it's too cloudy, then you have a respiratory infection. So I'm just going to quickly finish up with the skeletal system. I'm not going to go in detail about the bone. There's too many bones to uh, discuss them all individually. Um, the unique features of the avian uh, skeleton is that they are closely packed together. Uh, they, it's lightweight, so it doesn't weigh much, but it still supplies good support, especially in the wings, which are important in flying. As I said, the pneumatic bones are the hollow bones that the, some of the air sacs uh, end in, and they are important in the respiratory system of birds. And the pneumatic bones equal, uh, include the skull, the humerus in the wing, the clavicle in the shoulder, the sternum in the breast, the pelvic girdle, and the lumbar and sacral vertebrae uh, in the, the back. Medullary bones are another special bone of, um, of chickens, of birds. Uh, it's an important source of calcium, which is the primary component of eggshells. Chickens can't eat enough calcium at one time to meet the requirement for the development of a shell. So calcium is pulled out of the bones and then replaced uh, later. Um, so it, you know, they, they don't replace all of it. So after a period of time, if they're laying continuously, the bones can become very weak and brittle. So you'll find that the bones of uh, old laying hens can be very brittle and have to be handled with care. The medullary bones include the tibia and uh, femur in the leg, the pubic bones, the ribs, the ulna in the wing, the toes, and the scapula in the shoulder. So I went through that very quickly. Uh, I made it in time with five minutes <laughs> to spare for questions. Um, that is my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. We also have a Facebook page for Poultry Extension, which is part of the eExtension program. Um, I post... Uh, when webinars are coming up, when the recordings are available, and any news items like the latest avian influenza outbreak in, uh, well, no, one farm in, uh, turkey farm in Minnesota, um, the updates on, um, you know, when uh, different legislation changes or, you know, little tidbits of stuff that I put in there. And the extension.org slash poultry has a lot of fact sheets that um, have a lot of material there that you can use. If you don't find what you're looking for, you can ask an expert. Um, so just type in your question. Uh, it can take a while to get through the system sometimes. Um, I get notified, but I don't always answer all the questions. They get assigned to other people. Um, so if you have a question and want a quick answer, you're better off uh, emailing me. Okay, Ken, when doing surgery on a chick at one to three days old, usually many air sacs are broken. Does that influence much to chick respiration or system and whether they can recover after that? Thanks a lot for your answer, much appreciated. 
um, why are you doing surgery on chicks one to three days old? Um, I don't know why you would want to do them, do surgery on the chicks. Um, if the air sacs are broken, then you're opening the respiratory system to bacterial infection. Um, and it can have an influence on the um, respiratory system of the chickens. Um, chickens can recover quite quickly um, from different things, but um, yeah, I don't know why you do surgery on chicks one to three days old. Um, can you tell me why? What is it you're doing? No comment. Okay. Are there any more questions? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't scroll down far enough. They might have it. Oh, for transplantation from one breed to another. Now, that's a new one on me. Um, <laughs> what are you transplanting? Uh, is this a research based thing that you're doing? Um, interesting. Ovary and testes transplantation. You're doing some sort of research. Um, yeah, that's an interesting research. Um, typically, if you are doing it carefully, you should not um, break too many. Uh, air sacs, you may need to um, look at your uh, transplant surgery technique to see if you can do it with um, less uh, problems in the to the air sacs. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? We have a minute left. Well, not seeing any questions. Um, if you go to the uh, extension.org slash poultry, you can see um, what, what, what webinars are coming up. Uh, we have uh, one booked in December, uh, which is me. I'm finishing off the year this time. I don't normally do. Oh, God, I can't type today. Uh, Stark.org slash poultry. I believe it is on. Um, it's on nutrition, I think. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, it's feeding a small and backyard poultry flock. It looks more at the practicality of uh, feeding. We had a webinar um, a few months ago that looked at uh, nutrition, an overview of poultry nutrition. Uh, so I wanted to go into um, more practicalities of feeding. Uh, feeding whole grains, soaking, fermenting feed or grains, mixing your own feed, probiotics, prebiotics, essential oils, pros and cons of these different feeding programs, um, and whatever else you want to talk about. So it should be an interesting way to finish off the year. And it is December 4th at 3 p.m. It's a Tuesday. So I'm not, oh, wait a minute, let me scroll down. Okay, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions. So thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, one more. Uh, I hope to see you again uh, on uh, December 4th. Thank you very much, Mark, for hosting us again. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. uh, everybody have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.